Hi everyone and welcome to CodeFX and Effective Java 3rd Edition. I'm Nikolai and I'm in Oslo right now for Java Zone, which is going to be so cool. Today, item 2. Consider a builder when faced with many constructor arguments. To which I want to say, nee. Now, I'm going to assume that you've read the item. If you didn't, you may want to pause and do that now. If you don't own the book, consider buying it from one of the affiliate links down there in the description box. You will find also other links there, including to the GitHub repo, which contains all the code snippets that I show you here. With all of that said, let's dive right in. So, why the mixed feelings towards the builder pattern? Well, its main motivation is to simplify the creation, or the instantiation rather, of complex classes. Instead, I'd rather simplify the classes themselves. And there are usually ways to do that. If, for example, a, parameter, uh, sorry, a constructor has a lot of parameters, like for person you might have a first name, middle name, last name, zip code, street, whatever, then you can usually reduce that by creating proper abstractions between there. There could be a name type capturing all name-related information, there could be an address type capturing all address-related information, and then you end up with a person class which has two fields, namely name and address. There are cases where a constructor might have a lot of arguments of the same type, and then order becomes, the compiler can't check order and it's hard to mix them up. Most cases those types are usually primitives or strings, and once again, there's most likely an abstraction missing there. So for example, email addresses, I would never pass around email address as a string. I would have an email address type, you know, which also uh, does all kinds of verification and offers other services to me. But the point is, I can then replace one of these string arguments with an email address, and there you go. Uh, no way to, to have collisions or, uh, sorry, confusion or to mix things up. And then the last one is that you feel, uh, sorry, that your class might have a lot of optional fields fields that can be absent, where you can have null or some meaningful default values. And then creating constructors for all of these combinations um, is basically impossible once you go above a certain number of optional fields. Again, in those cases, usually there's a better way to do it, or a different way to do it. And those most often involve uh, in producing new types or um, creating using maps or other color kinds of collections to collect all of the um, optional information in one field. So yeah, I think there are often better ways to solve the my class is too complex or my construction is too complex problem than using the builder pattern. In fact, I can't even recall when was the last time that I used the builder pattern. So while it's definitely a valid choice, I think it should be the last in a series of efforts to try and simplify the code. So let's have a quick look at the builder pattern. I'm um, using the same example as Joshua Bloch does in Effective Java. We have, think about the food label on the back of, the, of your food. Uh, there are nutrition facts on their serving size, servings, fat, sodium, carbohydrate, that kind of stuff. And so in this example, uh, serving size and servings are required fields, whereas fat, sodium, carbohydrates are optional fields, there may not be any information there, uh, which in this case is lucky because zero then is an actual usable default value. We'll see later why that plays a role. Now, having constructors for two required fields and then all kinds of combinations for three optional fields gets out of hand immediately, so he says use the builder pattern as a solution. Uh, the builder basically has the same kind of information. The required ones are, replied the, are supplied to the constructor, and the optional ones you will then set with these setters, fat, sodium, and the like. Then you call build, and then the pa constructor passes itself to the class, and then the class simply pulls out all the information of the builder. How does it look in practice? If you use, use it, you will say create a new builder, set the fat, the carbohydrates, then build the resulting object, and then you get um, the nutrition facts back. That's all fine and dandy, but I don't actually think that, I, I'm, I'm sure I wouldn't have used the, con the builder pattern here. The underlying problem is that you have these optional fields, and I think there's a better solution. And while we're doing that, we can also fix the fact that there's five plain ins which don't give you any information about the unit, any description of what's, what's going on, it's just fat. Um, so, there are better ways to structure this, and I have two approaches. The first one is a little simpler. I create nutrition facts interface, which gives an amount and a unit. And then I create a constructor. Uh, sorry, I create a class. No constructor has a constructor. But I create a class which has two required fields, serving size and servings. These are nutrition facts. But then it solves all these optional ones in a data, data structure. If you think about this table, you can think of it as basically mapping fat and sodium to the amounts. And so that's a map, right? So why not use a map for that? So I use a map to store all the optional stuff in there. The constructor takes two required arguments, 
And then you can also have uh, the map for the optional stuff. I map from nutrition fact type to nutrition fact. So that's a new thing I had to do here. Uh, I created an enum which covers all the different kinds of nutrition facts I might have, serving size, servings, fat, all that stuff. And you can, of course, reuse that throughout the rest of the system, so I think it's fair game to create a new type here. And then you can ask for serving size and servings, you can ask for fat and you get an optional back because, hey, maybe you don't have, there is no information there. And then you can even ask in general about any kind of fact. You just give me the enum and I go through my internal representation and pull out the value if I have it. If not, the return value would have been empty, empty optional. This fixes uh, the fact that we have primitives. Now we have a little bit more type information. And also push, pushes all these optional fields uh, into a proper data structure. And that means we don't need a builder anymore, which greatly simplifies code. The, if you look at the application, if you look how to use it, you will see that I create, I immediately create the nutrition facts without any builder. I provide one for serving size and one for servings, and then I create a map. And this is fairly readable. It tells you apparently there's fat 20 gram and carbohydrates 25 gram. So I'm pretty happy with this. But then I realized maybe there's still a lack of information. You could even go be more specific. Instead of having a simple nutrition fact which just covers all kinds, you could actually have you could actually have an individual type for each kind of fact. I put them onto one class so it's easier to find them, but it doesn't matter, uh, of course. So here you have a serving size is one type, servings is one type, fat is one type, and so on and so forth. And if we look at how to use this, we'll see that now we can have two fields whose type actually express... Excuse me, sir. I'm recording a video right now. You can be in it if you want, but I'm just... <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> So I have two fields of those concrete types that I have, serving size and servings, which means there's no way to, um, to mix this up. There's no way to accidentally put fat where there should be servings. That's great. I still have a map, but now I don't need that enum anymore. I can just map from the type uh, that I have to the fact. That also simplifies the constructor. We'll see that in a minute how to, how to call it. We can now give, just have a varax argument here, and then I collect them into a map. Now, if you want to have concrete, um, nutrition fact, you can just tell me which one I have. You want to have serving size or servings or fat, that's great. But you can also give me a class, any class that extends nutrition fact, and I'll check whether I have an, whether I have an instance of that available. And if I do, I return it to you. So let's see how this looks. This is arguably the cleanest result. You just use a constructor new and you just say I have serving size, servings, fat, carbohydrates, and just new all of these classes and put them in there. and. There you go. The result is, I think, just as readable as the builder pattern. It's much simpler to code up because you don't need the actual builder. And it's much richer information because now I have a type for serving size and I can do all kinds of, add all kinds of information here. So this, I think, uh, is a better solution to the problem. So I would, as I said, I would apply the builder pattern last and try other solutions before that. Joshua Bloch mentions a couple of small things in passing that I want to expand on. Uh, one of them is that you should copy values and then check them and not the other way around. What does he mean by that? The builder is highly mutable, right? Everybody can call a setter on that. And if it's used across different threads, which first red flag, then what you do not want to do is have someone set a value that is valid. In the constructor of your class, you take the builder, you check whether the value is indeed valid, whether let's say fat is positive. And if it is, then you assign the value. Because in the meantime, somebody else could have changed the fat to negative five and that doesn't make sense. So revert that order. First, copy the property over and then later check on that property so you're sure it can't be touched anymore. Now you might say, why do that at all? Can just the builder check that? And yes, definitely the builder should check whether fat is not negative. But sometimes you can only check stuff if you have several, um, you have several parameters at once in your hand to make sure whether they're valid together. And that doesn't work well with the builder because he gets them one by one. Uh, the second thing is for the, if you use a builder pattern, I personally would put every call on the next line in the book, maybe to save uh, real estate, uh, paper real estate. <laughs> Just block to puts the the setters on the same line be, behind, so in a, in a row, so like new nutrition builder, and then set, 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 build. And I wouldn't do that. Uh, I think it's more readable if you have a single uh, each call on a single line. But hey, you manage me very. Finally, he says that other languages who have uh, name parameters 
do not actually need the builder pattern. And he's 100% right there. It's funny, like people, some people say, and I, I, I grow to believe that it's actually true, that patterns are only there to fix uh, lacking features or shortcomings in a language. The problem is, if you have very many optional fields, that there's no simple way to create constructors for all of these in Java. But in Kotlin, for example, which you see an example there, it's really easy to have, to have a class that has three required and two optional fields. And then on the constructor, you simply just assign the optional ones that you want, and the other one you just leave blank on the default value. And because you can name these constructors, uh, sorry, you can name the parameters in the constructors, that's really readable, and you don't need a builder pattern at all, and you get the same great result. Yeah. If you use the builder pattern after all, then there are some cool things you can do with it. So let's have a look at this. There's a car factory here, and then I add a body for the car and a spoiler, paint, decal, tires. I build it, get a car back. So far, so easy. In this case, uh, I don't actually add, I created no new body, I just created a new convertible. So it's a special kind of body. And then I add a rear spoiler, which makes sense. But what I can't do is I can't add a roof spoiler, because then I get a compile error. But that begs the question, wait, why does the spoiler method on up here accept the roof spoiler and the boiler, spoiler method down here doesn't? And the, uh, the hint, uh, the IntelliJ type hints are actually an indication of what's going on here. Because if I call carfactory.body, I don't actually get the carfactory back. I get a new instance of the type with body back. And spoiler keeps the same type, but then paint returns with painted body. And then decal doesn't change that. And then tires gives me with painted body and tires. Sounds like the tires are painted. Never mind. Uh, so if I call con body with a convertible, I don't get it with body back, back but a with convertible body. And then, of course, spoiler would simply not accept any kind of spoiler, but just rear spoilers here. Whereas the method on with body, which accepts the spoiler, accepts any kind of spoiler. What you can do this way is you can encode information, encode logic in the type system so the compiler can help you catch errors early. And what you do this way is you deepen the structure. Like a basic build, a common builder is basically flat. It's just one class, and you can set all these fields. And then in the end, you can verify at runtime whether you got all the information that you need. This way, you can encode, as I said, encode logic and type system, and then you can create deeper types. Type the one type returns the next type and the next type. If you used to think about automatons, then this is actually very similar. Uh, you start with one node, start with, in this case, the car factory, and then depending on what you do, you go into different areas uh, of, of, of your types that you set up. And then in the end, you can only call build, for example, when you've got all these things set. So only the with painted body and tires class has a build method. So if I move the build method up here, like this, for example, it just simply doesn't exist. So yeah, if you start with the builder pattern, then you can encode some of the logic in the type system if you want to. Of course, it takes a lot of work. If we have a look at the car factory, then that's fairly simple. But then it soon returns a with body. And then you have to look at the with body class. And that's also, it's two fields and the with body class. And then with convertible body, it's very similar. Then you get a painted body at some point back to add more fields. And so this is a lot more coding effort, of course. And uh, that I, I don't think that makes sense in general but it may make sense in some specific situations where you mean more like a, like a domain-specific language kind of thing. Keep in mind that the builder can do much more than simply pass through data. It can contain all kinds of logic. It can set meaningful defaults. It can uh, infer uh, values from other values. It can uh, take a complex object and destructure it and parts only certain parts onto the constructor. It can go the other way around and accept various various values and then combine them together into, into an aggregation and then pass that to the constructor. Um, what else? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, one, of the, one of the important things that made static factory methods so interesting, if you remember from the last video, was that they exert type control. So that means with a constructor, you always get the, the type that you call new on. With static factory methods, you can get a more suitable type. The same is, of course, true for the, for the builder. Uh, an example that I showed you with the convertible, when you add a convertible body, well, the, the sorry, the builder could, when you call build, actually decide to return a convertible instead of a car. So the builder has control over which type um, it builds in the final call and can make that, it can make that uh, dependent on all kinds of parameters that it got before. Finally, a builder can be reused. So consider this like, if you know the term partial application of a constructor, 
if you have a complex construction of, a, of an object, then it may be the case that you don't have all the parameters at once. Maybe you get some parameters early and some later and some even later. And then you have to drag them all around until at the very end you can just construct a bigger thing. With the builder, that's not necessary. What you could do instead is once you get the body and the spoiler, you just put that into the builder. And then the instance of the builder you get back, you pass it on and you pass it on. So you configure the, the build slowly over time. And in the end, you can build not just one, but many, cons uh, many uh, instances. You can reuse the builder time and again. So these things uh, can make the builder much more interesting than simply passing through some fields. There's a really cool thing that Josh shows in Effective Java that there's actually not a really need to repeat it because he explains it so well. But I still want to do it because it's so damn cool. Um, imagine you have a person interface, or in this case, an abstract class, and then two extensions of that, the freelancer and the employee. So you have like a small type hierarchy. And uh, all have names and addresses, which is uh, defined in person. And then maybe employee and freelancer would have their own methods, but they don't at the moment. Doesn't matter for the demo. Now, for, for some reason, we also have the builders. And we want to have a freelancer builder where we can call name on and then get uh, set the name. And then we call build at some point and get a freelancer. We want to have the same with the employee builder. So where does the name method come from? Should an employee builder and a freelancer builder be unrelated and both have a name method? Well, that, first of all, that duplicates code, which is, a, which is a, let's say it's an orange flag, not a red flag necessarily. But it's, an, it's, it's a flag that tells you maybe something's wrong. And I think it is something wrong, because it's not only, it doesn't only duplicate code, but it duplicates code that comes from the same source of truth, namely the name field in the person class. So there should be a way to not only deduplicate the code and make it easier to program, but also to make this more correct by having the same, by, by having one, uh, just one method. So that's easy, right? You have an employee builder and a freelancer builder, so you, then you just create a person builder. Now, that is true, but if you call name on a person builder, it would usually return its, it returns itself, so you can make this fluent calls, it returns this. But if it would return person builder here, then you could not use the employee builder API anymore. So under the assumption that employee can do something special, employee builder must, must most likely also do something special. So if I create a new employee builder, then call name, and then get a person builder back, then I can't really use it as an employee builder anymore. I mean, it's still the same instance, but the compiler can't guarantee it anymore. So if I put person builder here, then specific code specific to employee builder or freelancer builder here would fail. Now, how do we get around that? That's where the self thing comes in. Uh, other programming language have a construct where you can co express to the compiler, this is my own type. Uh, Java actually can't do that. There is no reference there. You can at runtime say get class, uh, but that's not the same. Even now if I say per person builder class, it's not the same as a type here. So I cannot reference the type of myself, but I can use generics to kind of like trick the compiler into that. So I have two generic arguments. The first one, p extends person, um, is there so build can guarantee that it returns a concrete person, not just a general person. Josh doesn't do that in his book, and it doesn't matter here. So that's, that's an unrelated issue. Uh, we could do it just the same without p extends person. What we do instead, what is the critical part here, is we have this type self, and self extends the same class again, person builder of p and self. So let's not think too hard about it, because I'm not even sure whether I get it. Like, uh, the longer I think about it, the less I think I get it. So let's stop that now. Self is a generic type that references the own type that I am. So now I know which type I am and can put it here, in, put it into the um, return type and say, look, I'm returning the same type as I am. Which is almost, we're almost done now. But if we just return this, we get a compile error because this is of type person builder in general. There are two ways to get around this. Uh, Joshua Bloch used the proper way, which is to create an abstract method called self, which is supposed to return something of type self. And then you can implement that in employee builder just say return this, but then it's a method public employee builder self. And public freelancer builder self, likewise, you just return this. And then the compiler is happy. Here the compiler isn't actually happy. I have warnings turned off. Um, but you would get a warning here because it's an unsafe, unsafe cast. I think it's still fine because I have total control over this, over this code. And I can guarantee that at runtime this will always uh, succeed. Well, at runtime there is no extra cast there anymore because self gets erased to person builder. But uh, that this, I'm not lying to the compiler. Uh, this uh, this uh, um, this cast, or oh, sorry, this this type information that I put in here is actually correct. So yeah, this way I inform the compiler that person builder does not return a person builder, but does actually return the concrete person builder um, that I'm that I'm operating on right now. And this way I can call name and address on person builder, but still get the concrete employee builder back and be able to use its API.
later on. Uh, this is a really cool trick in general. Uh, it doesn't have many applications and it is quite confusing, so it's not something that you should just use whenever you can. But if you must, then this is, can be a really powerful tool that gets you out of a tricky situation. So keep it in mind. Remember, you can reference your own type with a recursive uh, generic type de declaration. One thing Josh says is that uh, if you assume that you will have option parameters in a class in the future, that you will start, immediately start off the builder pattern. I mostly disagree with this. Um, his argument is that if you have a public constructor and then add a builder later, then the constructor sticks out like a sore thumb and you, uh, um, you don't want to have that, you would want to make it private and that breaks client code. Which is true if you deliver code to users as a library developer, for example, but that's rare. Most developers are working on applications. Uh, you're most likely to have control over all the call sites, so then it's easy to refactor towards the builder whenever you feel like it. So like with static factory methods, I would say start out with the constructor, take the first or second optional parameter that you cannot avoid with constructors, and then later, if that doesn't work, move to the builder pattern. Now IntelliJ can help you with that. Um, if you have a constructor like this one, open the refactor menu, and then down here you will have replace constructor with builder. Let's do that. We'll create a new class somewhere else. It's slightly annoying, but anyway. Uh, and now, like with static factory methods, it not only created the builder, but it also updated all call sites, which is the critical part here. So that's great. Now, it does a couple of things differently than uh, Josh Bloch does. For example, um, first of all, it doesn't make the constructor private, but that's a quick fix. It doesn't replace the parameters with the builder. So Josh describes it as passing the builder into the constructor and then pulling everything out of the builder. Um, they don't do it here. Either way is fine with me. Uh, if you want to have the builder here, it's also a comparatively quick fix. And then also it calls this method set instead of just name. But once again, uh, this is a fairly small fix. What is more annoying about this is there's no, at least I didn't find one. If you have one, leave a comment, that would be awesome. Uh, I didn't find a way to easily add a field. So I want to have uh, also an address like this. Uh, address. Now, what am I going to do now? So, um, add it to the constructor automatically, add constructor parameters. There you go. But then the, pros, the person builder, uh, which is here, doesn't create it perfectly anymore. So, this is a compile error. So, I add the address here. Then, where does it come from? I have to add it here. You know where this is going. And in the end, I had to edit the same thing like in 10 different places, uh, which is not something that I usually uh, enjoy doing. Is this right? Now return your person name address. No, that should be right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, package visible. Private doesn't work if it's in a different class. I will put the builder like Josh does into the same class, and then private is fine too. So yeah, that's that. Start out with the constructor. Refactor later if you need it. Unless you don't have control over all call sites, then start with the builder. In summary. When you have complex object creation, consider using the builder pattern. But my recommendation is to first try to simplify the object creation itself, for example by removing optional fields and by using higher level abstractions to reduce the number of parameters, particularly of primitive types and strings. When using the builder pattern, remember to first copy parameters and check them afterwards. And also, and I forgot to mention that, I recommend the same thing as for static factory methods, making the constructor private as possible and otherwise protect it, but I wouldn't have a builder and a public constructor. Keep in mind that the builder can be much more than just a stupid data carrier. It can do all kinds of things for you. It can uh, provide meaningful default values for parameters. It can aggregate them. It can split them up. It can validate them. And the builder can also exert type control, having the build method uh, pick the type that it instantiates depending on the arguments that you gave to the setters before. You can also encode much of your domain logic in the type system, if you go far enough and don't just have one builder type, but several builder types by calling certain setters transitions you from one type to another. Finally, if you share code between builders, make sure to use a, um, a recursive generic type parameter self. Whereas effective Java recommends to start out with the builder as soon as you assume that object creation will become complex in the future, I recommend to stick with constructors until you hit that point and then refactor to a builder using your IDE's tools. Now, that is not true if you ship code to customers or users, because in that case, uh, making constructor private afterwards will break that code, of course. I really hope you like this video. If you do, do all the internet things with the thumbs and the subscribe and the follow. Also, check out courses.colofx.org, where I publish more videos like this. And make sure to go to GitHub and play around with the sources yourself. Finally, if you have any questions or widely agree or disagree with what I said, leave a comment down below. And if you've got all of this covered, consider checking whether you can help one of your fellow Java developers.
Cut. Fuck. Let's dive right in. Let's dive. Let's dive right in. Let's dive right in. I never said goodbye. No. <laughs>